Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Gilmore. I'm a professor of family law in the Faculty of Law here and uh, director of the Cambridge uh, Family Law Centre. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all, uh, those in the audience before me here and those watching online. A uh, very warm welcome. Uh, welcome to tonight's event, which is entitled The Lundy Model of Child Participation, Space, Voice, Audience and Influence for Young People in Decision Making When Parents Separate. The Lundy model in this title, of course, is referring to one of our distinguished speakers tonight, Professor Laura Lundy, and her way of conceptualizing Article 12 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. We're absolutely delighted, Laura, uh, that you've been able to join us here this evening and, and tell us more about your, uh, your work in relation to children's rights. Let me tell you a little bit about Professor Laura Lundy. Laura Lundy is co-director of the Centre for Children's Rights and Professor of Children's Rights at Queen's University Belfast and Professor of Law at University College Cork. She is Joint Editor-in-Chief uh, of the International Journal of Children's Rights and is a qualified barrister. Her 2007 paper, Voice is Not Enough, is one of the most highly cited articles ever on children's rights and the model of children's participation that it proposes based on four key concepts, space, voice, audience and influence is used extensively in scholarship and practice. The Lundy model of child participation is core to the Irish National Children's Participation Strategy in 2015 and National Framework on Child and Youth Participation and has been adopted by international organisations such as the European Commission and World Health Organisation and a number of global NGOs such as World Vision and UNICEF. We are delighted also to have with us tonight Professor Anne Barlow and Dr. Jan Yui, who will be discussing their recent work on child inclusive mediation, which has resulted in a recent co-authored monograph entitled The Right to be Heard, Children's Voices, Family Disputes and Child Inclusive Mediation. And this is to be published by Bristol University Press in 2024. Professor Anne Barlow, a uh, fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, is Professor of Family Law and Policy at the University of Exeter Law School. She is a socio-legal researcher and has led a number of empirical research projects, including ma mapping uh, paths to family justice and the recent Healthy Relationship Transition Study, on which the recent book draws. She has served as an academic member of the Family Justice Council between 2011 and 2015, and as a member of the government's task force on family mediation in 2014. Her co-authored book, Mapping Paths to Family Justice, Resolving Family Disputes in Neoliberal, Neoliberal Times, published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2017, together with Rosemary Hunter, Janet Smith Smithson, and also Jan Ewing uh, uh, here, uh, won the Hart SLSA Book Prize in 2018. Dr. Jan Ewing, uh, my colleague, is Assistant Professor of Family Law at the University of Cambridge, Deputy Director of the Cambridge Family Law Centre, and a Fellow of Homerton College, Cambridge. She was formerly a Research Fellow in the University of Exeter, and her research interests are in children's rights, particularly the exercise of those rights when parents settle out of court following separation, she is a former family law solicitor uh, and is the co-author of Mapping Paths to Family Justice, Resolving Family Disputes in Neoliberal Times, which I've already mentioned, and which was awarded that uh, Hart SLSA Book Prize. And of course, I've also already mentioned her co-authored uh, monograph uh, with Anne, Anne Barlow, which is due to be uh, published. So we have a, a very distinguished panel uh, and a very interesting topic. So may I first invite uh, Professor Laura Lundy to uh, talk about her interpretation of Article 12 and children's rights. Thank you. Thank you to Anne and Jan for the invitation to be here and also for using the work. Um, I'm going to begin tonight's presentation with an overview of uh, what is now known as the Lundy model. I want to make a statement at the start, which is that I did not call it the Lundy model. <laughs> I actually tried to insist that it would not be called the Lundy model. It was the Irish government called that and it stuck. But OK, we're here with the Lundy model. That is what it is now known as. Um, I'm going to describe um, how it came to be. And then I'm going to say, you know, um, locating it within its child rights framework and then describe it very briefly. I want to say at the start, I'm, I'm really delighted <clears throat> with this project, with this work and with this book. 
one of the areas of child participation that is still really underserved in terms of children's rights is, is family law. And I think particularly when parents separate. So I think this is an incredibly important piece of work and I'm delighted to be here um, to hear more about it as well. So we, my background is in law, as it was said, and human rights. And the way I come at child participation is through the lens of the Convention on the Rights of the Child primarily. Um, I mean, there are other ways of looking and defining participation, but this is ours. And I think for most people in this room and joining us online, that would be well understood. Uh, others will look at it as effective services or other frameworks, but this is ours, the child rights, the child's human right. This is the text that we focus on primarily. It's Article 12 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. I'm not going to read it to you and nor am I going to test you on it. It is actually quite a complex uh, provision for a human rights treaty. And we see that we know that it was contested. It was not an easy right when it was negotiated as, by states parties um, over the 70s and 80s. It's a complex right. And I think that's part of the reason that I came to invent what is now the Lundy model, because it is not well understood. Also want to mention, because we should, is that there is a very similar right with an addition in Article 7.3 of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which strengthens Article 12 for children with disabilities, firstly, by dropping reference to capability, a capacity to form a view, and secondly, because it talks about having disability appropriate assistance. So I'll come on to talk about how it's a right of all children, but I think that we need to look at both of them. One of the most asked questions and one of the things we're going to hear about this evening from um, Anne is about the benefits of doing this and the benefits of doing it well, particularly the benefits to children themselves. And we know there's an increasing amount of research, not just in family contexts, of what those benefits might be, more confidence, better self-esteem, better relationships. There, there's evidence of all of that. But I want to say this one thing, in some, in some, to some extent, it doesn't matter because it's a human right. It's a human right of children. And once we recognize that it has, it is a human right, it doesn't matter if things get better, if children are more confident, if better decisions are made, it's a human right. And it doesn't have to have benefits. It's wonderful when it does because it convinces people to comply. And I think that's why your evidence is really so significant and so important in this particular space, but it's a human right. And that asks, takes us to another question, why? Why do children have this human right and we don't? We adults do not have this right. And it takes us to thinking about why anyone has any human right. And human rights, of course, are grounded in basic concepts such as dignity, equality, and respect for our human worth. And the way that we as adults enjoy those is that we usually get to make the decisions that impact on our lives. We usually get to decide, for example, who we live with, you know, what we do, what we study, those are within our, our range of choices. But children live under the reality that many, many decisions are made for them. They don't get to make the decisions in their own lives and the particular context of family separation, that is very significant. But because we want to afford children dignity, equality and respect, even in that reality of their dependence on adults to make decisions, we have Article 12. And Article 12 is, recognizes the reality of dependence on adults, but says to those adults, if you are making a decision that affects a ch child, like who they live with, who has custody of them, it is your obligation to seek their views and to take them into account. One last thing really, I suppose, is that, and I think that comes across very much in your study and in the, in the findings that I've looked at, is that it's not just a right in itself. It's an important right in itself, dignity, equality, and respect, but it's a way in which we implement children's other human rights. So for example, in this context, it's a way in which they can develop. It's in a way in which they can receive information. It's a way in which they fundamentally can be protected from harm. So it's an incredibly important right in itself and as a way of ensuring that children enjoy the full range of their other human rights. One tiny little example, because it came up recently and every now and again, I'm just blown away by a piece of evidence of what children see 
and feel and know that we as adults don't. And in this case, it's from Ireland. It's from Bernardas, Ireland. He had a group of children. They're called the the Yappers, <laughs> which I think is you know that's quite an Irish thing. But anyway, they're the Yappers, and the Yappers are children who have experienced domestic violence in the form of coercive control. And these children identified and named and described what coercive control looks like in the context of childhood. And there are so many things there that would not appear if we were asking adults what coercive control looks like. One of the ones that comes up, we, we, we do an awful lot of research with children all over the world. And if you do any of the research with children on their lives, one of the things they mention, for example, all the time that adults don't necessarily, although I might be an exception, are their pets. So one of the ways in which coercive control can be exercised on children mm -hmm. is the violence towards their pets, kicking the dog, kicking the cat, threatening the dog. So it's just that sense of children see and feel and experience things that adults do not. And we cannot know and we cannot presume to know, which is why it's really important that we talk to them. For me then, um, the Lundy model, it started uh, 20 years ago with a study for the, the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People. And in that study, we, um, we were asked to talk to um, adult professionals and we were also asked to talk to uh, children to hear their own views on their enjoyment of their human rights. And what I experienced was this disconnect. There was the lawyer in me who was looking at the actual text of Article 12 the interviews with adults were saying, yes, yes, we do that. The, the voice of the child is really important in our work, whether that was in family, whether it was teachers, social workers, whatever context, it was part of the, the, the professional competence frameworks, for example, and they thought they were doing it. And then meanwhile, we had data from over a thousand children. And what children were saying was actually, no, our views are not sought. We're not asked what we think when decisions are being made, or if we're asked what we think, our views are dismissed, they're not taken seriously. Or, and this was, I think, the wake up call to me. Children were saying, we are giving our views, and if we give our views, it puts us at risk because we are considered to be challenging adult authority. And that means it can be very risky for us. And this is the image that we chose as the front of that report. And it was, I was thinking about it this evening as I was thinking about your work, because this one was drawn in the context of family life and the person's a mother and a boy drew this saying, the mother saying to the boy, you shouldn't be telling me what to do. And the child is saying, I was just telling you what I think. And I was thinking about this direct, this direct relationship and how it can be hard between adults and parents and about the role of mediation that you have shown so well in your study and the ways in which the child's views can be brought to parents in ways that are safe and, and not as risky as children was, were telling us then. But for me, it got me thinking about particularly that something wasn't quite right. And the concept that initially troubled me was this concept of voice, the voice of the child. And I started thinking there's something about this that is doing this really fundamental human right uh, disservice in terms of implementation. And I suggested that these concepts were all abbreviations that could potentially undermine implementation. And I started thinking about how could we do it better? And I wrote the article, voice is not enough. And reading Article 12, as we, of course, must do with other provisions in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, I suggested we need more than voice. We need space. We need voice. We need audience. And we need influence. Those concepts came partly from the text of Article 12 and partly from what children were telling us about the ways in which they were not enjoying their right and then partly from reading it with the other rights in the Convention. But this was the mix that I came up with. Uh, I honestly didn't realize it would end up being called the Lundy model and would be used all over the world one day. I, I did say that I wanted it to be user friendly and legally sound when I published it. Um, this is the this is the image which I use most often now and I know that you have used. This was the one most recent version of the model that is created by the Irish government. And it's there to pre present it as it should be as cyclical. To me, space and voice are about the way of implementing the first part of Article 12, the right to express a view, 
and audience and influence are about the second part, the obligation to give the views due weight in accordance with age and maturity. Um, for a long time, I was a little confused myself about the overlap. <laughs> People would say, oh, there's a bit of overlap between space and voice and audience and influence. And it's true. And I think the where I'm currently at, though I haven't written it up in any paper yet, is that I think that space creates the conditions for voice and audience creates the conditions for influence. And that explains, I think, some of their relationship to each other. So I'm not going to go into each of the concepts individually because I've seen Jan and Anne's uh, presentation. They're going to do it really beautifully and powerfully with children's data. Um, each of them ha has elements of it that are related to rights. So for example, if we want to create a space where children will speak, not only do we have to make it active like mediation is, Crucially, I think in this context, it has to be a safe space. It's a space where children are protected from all forms of harm. And what I know from the, the many people who now use the model, I thought initially that they wouldn't be punished, but of course it's much more nuanced and sophisticated at that. And that's what your data I think shows. It has to be a space where the children trust the adult they're talking to. They have to be comfortable. And I think that's, you know, that's incredibly important in this context and you've shown that. It also has to be inclusive. It's a right of all children. One little mi mi misconception at the time I was writing it, I think it's better understood now, is some people think that the right, you only have to listen to children when they can say something sensible, when they're mature. But actually that only applies to the second part of the right, that limitation on due weight in accordance with age and maturity. The right is afforded to every child capable of forming a view every child capable of forming and that means very young children and it's again really important from a process perspective that even when you think they're too young they couldn't possibly understand the process of actually being asked it can be as important in itself as the outcome and again that, that aligns very much i know with your data in terms of voice it must be voluntary which i, I know must be a fundamental principle in mediation where my own work has focused in, in more recent time is around how we support children to form and express views. They don't necessarily know what they want. And then often when children are asked what they want when they haven't had time to process and think is that they'll say nothing, they'll be silent, or they'll jump to the view that they think the adult wants them to give. And part of the challenge here is ensuring there's child-friendly information, which is where I've done a lot of work. Uh, this is guidance I've written for the European Commission um, and a little example from the Council of Europe, working with children so that they understand what is going on. If children are going into a mediation process and, and the word mediation, will they know what that is? It's incredibly important that they're informed and they receive information that means they can prepare. They can prepare in terms of what they want, they can prepare emotionally, but they need to do it. In terms of audience then, um, act, I imagine mediation, mediators should be like, that's what their job is, active listening. They'll be wonderful at it and we should all learn from them. I would say active listening must be incredibly important. But again, where my own uh, thoughts have gone in recent years from learning from others is about making sure it gets to the right people. And I know perhaps in the mediation process that's determined and you'll speak about that. But in other processes, particularly in family law, a child might say something in one context but the person who needs to hear that is someone else. And I think it's really important that we get the things that children say, subject to confidentiality, of course, to the right people. This is from Leicester City Council. There are a bunch of uh, city and county councils across the UK, particularly in England, who use the Lundy model. And they call it everybody's business. And it's really saying, if you work with children, it's your business, it's a human right. And they have these posters all over their offices. Have you remembered space, voice, audience and influence and for me that is them saying you are the dedicated listener this is your responsibility or you are the duty bearer so the final concept is influence and one of the challenging aspects here and particularly i think in the context of family law and separation is the being realistic with children being honest about what a process is about what it can do and what it can't do because often not just in this context, children will not get what they want. They might want something and they, uh, and they might not end up getting it. It might not be possible, it might not be safe. And in that case, it's incredibly important that it is at least transparent 
And the way that we show transparency, like most human rights accountability, is through feedback and follow-up that we let children know and they understand. This is making meaningful engagement a meaningful term if we want them in. Feedback is critical. It's the critical juncture at which the adult who has sought the children's view is accountable to the child. I just popped this one in because I was speaking to Jan earlier and I was I realized it's a quotation from one of the young people who was it's it's not in the context of family separation, well it's, it's care proceedings. A young pe person in care who was on Leicester's care experience council and she wrote a speech one time where she summarized the Lundy model and um, I had the shivers when I read it. She did a much better job than I've just done with you. She took through the concepts, but she took them in terms of what they mean to her. And I think one of the things I want to highlight is her understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, her understanding that it doesn't necessarily mean getting what you want, but it absolutely means that you understand the processes going on, that you're taken seriously, you're treated with respect, and then you're told, definitely told why things can't happen if they can't happen. I'll skip that one. And so this has taken me to what is a kind of another adjunct for the Lundy model. It's called the 4F framework. It's been used by some governments. And that is saying that when we get back to children, whenever we're telling at the end of these processes what's going to happen, that we do it quickly. Children's lives, you know, they're, they're, they're growing up fast and, and they're immediate. And the, the impact on their rights, of course, is immediate. That we're detailed in terms of fill, that we communicate it in ways they understand and that we do what we say we're going to do because often we do not. And I've been suggesting questions that people can use for feedback. I'm, in, I'm curious to see how they would work in a mediation process. But I think one of the questions I always ask myself when I work with children and young people is they'll always say something that surprises you. There'll be something you don't expect them to say. And any time a child says something that surprises you in these processes, that is a, that is a flag to stop. Because if it surprises you, it means that your adult understanding and their, their personal individual experience is different. And that needs unpicked and understood. It's really important. So just wrapping up then, uh, it's appeal. Yeah, I think we credit the Irish government. It was being used by quite a few people. And then they decided they wanted me to work with them, particularly in policy making, which is where most of my own work is, um, to create what they called a checklist for policymakers, which became part of the Irish national strategy and now the framework. But somehow this little checklist, this little flower diagram caught on. And this is the one that is, was, is used by lots of people because it has very simple questions. And I know we're told as academics, you know, don't produce your work to checklist. You know, I was okay with that because the, the questions were prompts for reflection. And the whole of the Lundy model is a sense of not telling anyone what to do because it's different in every context. But the questions we should be asking ourselves are the same. And, and I have to say that Jan and Anne have done an incredibly incredibly good job of using those uh, questions in an area where they have substantive expertise to capture what children think. So if you're interested, the Irish uh, National Strategy has lots of toolkits that you can use in, in any context. Um, and those are the questions I think that you've been using, which is shows you that they get about. And um, there are planning checklists, there are evaluation checklists. And the one I like best is one that was created with children. And it's a checklist on the four concepts where children's uh, state, the children evaluate whether they feel heard. So this is a way of capturing whether the children themselves feel heard. Uh, it can be adapted for other context. The statement children added to that that isn't part of the, the other Lundy model questions is under voice. It's number six, and it's incredibly important. They said, I have, I had enough time to talk. I had enough time to talk. One of the qualities that children want in adults is patience. And often in the, the adults that they meet in their lives, particularly when their lives get complex and messy in the context of separation, is there's no time. So finally, um, kind of a myth that um, sometimes Article 12 is pitted against Article 3, the best interest principle, particularly I think in the context of family decision making. And just to say that's a false dichotomy, that this work and the work you're going to hear about shows 
that you cannot keep children safe if you don't hear them. We know that from all of the various historical abuse scandals across the world. But also you can't hear them if you don't keep them safe. And mediation strikes me from the data that you've shown is an incredibly powerful case for showing that it in itself can provide a space that is not available to children in the context of everything else going on where they can be feel safe enough to be heard. And finally, the most quoted bit, apart from space, voice, and audience, and influence, sometimes adults think this is an optional thing they can do when they have time where it fits or it seems they've decided the child's the right kind of child. It's a human right. It is not the gift of adults to decide. If the matter affects the child, they are entitled. It's the right of the child, not an optional luxury. Thank you so much for listening to me, and then I'll pass over to John. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, so uh, in the time that I have, I'm going to um, just be looking at what's to, what might need to change in terms of uh, child inclusive mediation, so CIM, to make it more Article 12 compliant. Um, and I'll be drawing on some findings of uh, what we've called the HEART project. It was a welcome uh, center funded project where we did some qualitative research with uh, 10 relationship professionals, uh, with uh, 20 child inclusive uh, mediators, 20 children and 12 parents, as well as uh, five uh, focus groups, uh, primarily with members of the Family Justice Young People's Board to look at um, experiences uh, when parents separate. And what, um, what what is so sort of powerful about the Lundy model, one of the uh, uh, relationship professionals said to us, well, you know, there's a whole world of talk about listening to children, but when it comes down to it, we find it very hard to actually do. And I think where the Lundy model helps us is that it just helps us to operationalize what that might actually look like, because uh, we can say that we're going to hear the voice of the child, but what does that actually mean? So, um, I'll be measuring um, the the CIM practice that we observed against uh, the Lundy model. So starting with space then. So uh, the children that we spoke to, um, you know, they'd met with the mediator. Um, so clearly their, their voices were being uh, and their views were actively being sought. Um, the mediators had planned the ambience of the of the meeting very very well. You know they thought carefully about the space um, that the children would be seen in, um, and the children told us that they could speak freely with the mediator because they felt very comfortable in the space that had been provided for them. So it's this third element. Um, you know the the um, have steps been taken to ensure that all children can take part. Um, that I want to to focus on. So, um, in terms of um, you know the the space that they were given, in terms of whether all children got a view, um, well, certainly actually there was no sense that all children capable of forming a view uh, were given that right. So um, we know from the um, uh, FMC, the Family Mediation Councils. A 2019 survey, which is the most up-to-date survey, that 26% of young people aged 10 and over had been given um, a voice uh, according to the feedback from that survey. Um, so there was no sense that all children in accordance with their um, Article 12 rights were heard, or indeed even all children over the age of 10, which is what the um, FMC's code of practice says, were given that opportunity. Um, as per the the you know the code of practice and the Lundy model, so um, you know the the children that were heard um, were given the space, but certainly it wasn't uniform, um, and still therefore some way to go before it is universal. Even though the young people that we spoke to said that they wanted it to be universal, um, so the the second part. Um, of stage one is is voice um and voice entails uh having appropriate information um and having your view facilitated um and the young people that we spoke to they understood that voluntary participation you know was was fundamental that they had a choice whether to be heard or not um and um 
that you know they knew it was their choice. In terms of the um, range of options um, that they were given, well, actually, you know, CIM was the only option on the table, and in fact, some of the um, relationship professionals that we spoke to, three of uh, the ten relationship professionals, said that actually, um, you know, they needed to have their voice fac facilitated, but that actually there may be better ways of doing that. So within a therapeutic setting, for example, either. Um, instead of, or, or quite possibly alongside um, child inclusive mediation. So um, certainly the feedback from them was that it shouldn't be the only option available. Um, but it's really, it's this, um, this third element um, that I want to talk about. Um, uh, and, and that's, um, you know, around kind of the, the information that they were given. So, you know, in terms of the options that they were given. Um, one of the things that we found actually was that um, kind of, the, you know, the, the, the um, whether it was, for example, online or in person, uh, whether it was with the same mediator that their parents saw or a different mediator, all of those decisions were primarily taken by the mediator and they were taken for mediator preference reasons. Um, and, um, they were taken for, um, you know, just practical reasons and uh, partly because of lockdown. But the children themselves and the parents, there was no sense from the interviews that we did with them that um, they were, you know, they were given any sort of choice. So um, there's certainly work to be done there around, you know, it being an assessment of the child's needs and led by what the child would prefer rather than just uh, preference of the mediators. Um, but it's really this the this third element. Were they given enough information um, that I want to look at? So um, the, the focus group participants who were primarily children who had not um, seen the mediator, um, they told us that actually they weren't. When, you know, when their parents separated, they did not get the information that they wanted or needed in order to... Um, you know, understand what was going on. And and they told us that primarily they wanted three things. They said that they wanted information on the process. So, you know, um, how would the process itself work? What say would they have in the decisions that were being made? They wanted some information on the practicalities around, you know, who they'd speak to and 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 those sorts of issues. And they wanted information on the support that was available and how they should access that. And um, primarily the people who'd not had child inclusive mediation just had not had that. And it had certainly adversely affected their recovery when their parents separated. Um, and then with the interviews with the young people who had had child inclusive mediation, um, what we found was that um, most of them were um, invited by someone other than the mediator. So primarily it was the it was the parents um, that had invited them. And of course it might be that the parents would want to speak to their child first about mediation, but actually young people needed to have, you know, a rich, some written information from the mediators. They needed um, an, an invitation from the mediators um, and that just wasn't there. So um, they, they'd, you know, they'd had the process explained to them, uh, perhaps by a parent, but of course, um, you know, we can't guarantee that the parent is going to give a, a consistent or an accurate um, view of, of what, what's going to be happening. And they'd had it explained to them when they got to the mediation, but they hadn't had anything up front. And so, you know, they, they, they definitely needed something up front there. Um, Stafford, Cairns and Marshall um, tell us that, you know, to have an Article 12 compliant process, um, that's got to start with accessible um, information, child-friendly information for young people. In terms of the, um, the process itself, giving them um, an audience and influence, this second part of the model, um, Firstly, audience. Um, audience is about, you know, the child's views have got to be communicated to someone with the responsibility to listen to them. Um, and unlike 
solicitor negotiations and collaborative law, mediation already does have, you know, uh, processes in place, clear established pathways in place and training so that children's voices can be heard. Um, and even if, though they hadn't, as I mentioned, had um, any written uh, information, the young people we spoke to actually said that they had established um, a good rapport uh, with with the with the mediator, and um, you know they had a clear idea as to how their views would be fed back. Um, but it's really this third limb about um, you know uh, does the person uh, with the power to make the decisions. Um, are they the person that, you know, the views are being communicated to? And obviously in, in other circumstances, it may well be um, very, very important for the child's views to be communicated directly to the person who's going to be making the decisions. Um, but in fact, actually, um, with mediation, the cornerstone of mediation is that the parents have control over the decision making. Um, and the mediator is a, a conduit rather than um, a decision maker. Um, but actually, as Anne will outline to you in a moment, um, the young people welcomed that. They thought it was a really positive thing to have this person that they could filter um, perhaps, you know, difficult messages to. Um, and and the, the parents themselves, they, um, they certainly welcomed it. Um, so, for example, um, one one parent, all of the names that we give you are pseudonyms, but one of the parents talked about, Bobby Gordon talked about it, it being a, a reality check. He said, you know, when you hear your child's views via a third party, um, that, that can be a real um, reality check for you. He talked about it hitting a nerve. Um, Trevor Cox said that he appreciated um, working with a professional who could you know, initiate a discussion and present it in a really constructive way. So for both the young people, as we'll hear in a moment, but also the parents, it had been a really constructive thing actually to have um, those views fed through a third party. Um, only two siblings, um, two young people, both of them siblings, had um, been unhappy with uh, the outcome of their mediation. And for them, it was because having expressed a view, their father had somewhat dismissively said, well, look, you know, I'm the adult, it's my decision. Um, and had essentially ignored what they'd said. Um, and they talked about the process having backfired on them. So I think it's just, it's really important um, that um, the, when mediation does happen, that the mediators talk very carefully with the uh, with the parents about how they might respond if, in fact, the children don't share a view um, that the 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 parents' um, views align with. So that you know, it's, it's just really important that there's a, a careful discussion about that um, from the outset. Um, and what about influence then? So influence requires ensuring that children's views are taken seriously and acted upon where appropriate. Um, and in child inclusive mediation, um, you, know, you know, the children's views were fed back to the parents. The parents were encouraged to take their views seriously and uh, use those to inform the agreements um, that were reached. So it's more this third limb um, that needs more consistent application. And that's around um, how you, with the children themselves provided with feedback explaining the reasons um, for why decisions had been made. Um, so, um, you know, the young people told us, uh, the ones that had engaged in mediation, they told us that, uh, you know, they knew that their, their views, uh, how, how the, their views would be fed back to the, um, to the parents. Um, but actually, say for one group of siblings, they'd all only ever seen the mediator once, um, and none of them had anything in writing afterwards from the mediator around how their views had been fed back. So that, you know, this is a real area that needs some careful thought um, from mediation um, because um, even though it, it was quite clear in our discussions with them that, that their views had influenced the decisions that were made, there wasn't any feedback to the children directly 
from the mediator as to how that had happened. So there really needs to be, you know, some sort of short child-friendly note explaining to the young people as to how their views were considered. Um, and so um, thinking about, you know, when we're thinking about giving young people space and voice and audience and influence, thinking about um, perhaps why that wasn't always happening, because um, as I say, you know, we didn't get any consistent um, sense that uh, it was happening um, uh, uh, across the board, as it were. Um, there seemed to be two reasons for that, mostly. Um, the first was around sort of the, the purpose of child inducive mediation. So there was no consensus from the mediators about actually what the purpose of child inclusive mediation was. So uh, for some, it was around, you know, uh, progressing matters. You know, we, we'll involve them, uh, involve the children uh, once we get, uh, uh, if there's an impasse. So for some, it was around progress. Um, for most, it was around child welfare and child well-being. Um, with perhaps some ancillary benefits like, you know, reducing conflict or improving communication. Um, and, and of course, they're laudable um, aims. But if you conceptualize child inclusive mediation in that way, then if there aren't any obvious welfare issues, or if you haven't reached an impasse, then you're not going to actually be including the voice of the child. So um, it, you know, it was the mediators um, who had, you know, kind of taken on board that this was a children's rights issue. They were the ones that were seeing children because once you conceptualize it as a children's rights issue, it becomes about, um, you know, how are we going to do this rather than whether we're going to do it. So um, certainly around the purpose, I think there needs to be some thought around the purpose of CIM amongst the mediation community and some consensus and maybe some training around that. Um, and the second thing was around confidence. So um, the mediators told us that uh, actually, you know, the reason that child inclusive mediation didn't happen um, as often as uh, perhaps it ought to was because of um, parental reluctance to do it. But actually we found very strongly that the mediators were the first gatekeepers and the ones that were confident either in the process in itself or in their abilities as child inclusive mediators, they were the ones that were doing it. The ones that were confident in the process that had taken on board that this is a rights issue were then framing it in such a way that they were seeing more children. Because if, you, if, if they were framing it as, your child has a right to, um, you know, to have their views heard. And in our practice, this is how we do it. Then that just helped with the whole question of parental reluctance. So, um, we, you know, there really needs to be this significant change in perception and, and seeing it as a right. So in terms then about, of, of what needs to change. So, um, in the book, which is uh, references on the last slide for that. And we've made some suggestions about systemic change that needs to happen. So uh, for example, um, you know, ultimately incorporation of the UNCRC, so that as I say, it becomes a question of how, not whether we hear from young people. Um, potentially expansion of the definition of parental responsibility to include a duty to consult young people on important decisions, um, uh, either as well as or um, as an alternative, expanding the scope of um, the paramountcy principle in section 1.1, because of course, at the moment, the paramountcy principle um, applies to court proceedings, but not out of court proceedings. And so doing that, we think would be a very good step forward. Um, and actually in the interim, better enforcement of practice direction 12B 4.4, because that talks about there being an expectation that children's voices will be heard. Um, so um, all of those things need to happen in the longer term, but these systemic changes will take time. And actually, you know, there is an international obligation. General comment number 12 is very, UNCRC general comment number 12 is very clear 
that um, children's UNCRC rights extend to mediation. And therefore, if there is this international obligation, what could the mediation community be doing uh, whilst um, you know we're we're uh, waiting for this systemic change to happen? Well, well, in our book, and we obviously expand on this much more um, in our book, but. Um, we suggest that we reconceptualize child inclusive mediation around a notion of relational family autonomy. Um, so uh, this is about um, a sort of, you know, decision making becoming a collective endeavor um, that extends beyond just getting the, the parents' views to align to actually directly including the children um, as the default position uh, where obviously where that's appropriate. And to be clear, this isn't to advocate that young people's views will, um, you know, always prevail because they won't. But it's about making sure that we gather those views and that those views are taken seriously. And as as Laura says, the gathering of the views from the competent child, um, it, it, you know, is, is a right. It's the weight that we then put on those views that, um, you know, has to be weighed in line with their age and understanding. So we think that there, there should be this sort of, um, you know, this just reframing really, so that we, we move away from just parental autonomy to a more relational um, uh, look that, that then would include children's views much more routinely. Um, we think that the Lundy model should just be adopted because it works. You know, it works and it it's a good framework for the mediation community. Um, to work towards. So we think that that, uh, as as they begin to, you know, the mediation community looks at CIM, it should include um, the Lundy model um, at its very foundation. Um, we also think that there should be a, a, a requirement that the mediator records how children's voices were heard and if they weren't heard, what the reason was, because that, we think, would concentrate mediators' minds to be just a bit more creative about these things and to think carefully about how to include this particular child's views um, unless, you know, there are very clear contraindications. Um, and finally, we think that there should be a code of practice. So um, at the moment, there's a code of practice for online mediation, but there is no code of practice for child-inclusive mediation. Um, and we think that, you know, that really should be addressed um, as a matter of priority, um, ensuring that the Lundy model is at the forefront of the, the minds of the uh, mediators who are tasked with the, the job of drafting that code. So um, thank you very much for listening. I'll hand over to Anne. Thank you. Yeah. 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 This may not be reflected in the CIM or the normal practices. Currently, parents have to get consent from jobs and say, child follow up appointments, or rather, if we're not saying how they have costs. Yeah, so um, so there was 20, uh, 20 mediators, um, child inclusive mediators. Um, and yes, you, you know, pa both parents do have to agree. And actually, we, we think that that's one of the issues because often one parent will agree and the other won't. We also think that cost is a big issue. So one of the mediators we spoke to had said um, that, uh, you know, a lot of mediators had made the what he called the intellectual shift towards accepting that children had to be heard, but that costs were still a really important impediment. Now, actually, the ones that really had made that shift were making it work. You know, they were they were being creative, they were finding ways of doing it, but it should not be their job to, you know, to fund it. It should be the government's job. But again, if we were to incorporate the UNCRC or if we were to move towards it being the default, and if we were to you know, um, see that there's evidence of better outcomes for young people, then it ought to then become the default and then the money would have to follow. But we do think that there's a really strong case for the government funding CIM and putting it on a proper footing. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. So the historically, when parents split up, the, the idea of keeping children out of court and then out of mediation uh, later on was because everybody wanted to protect the children from what was going on. But actually, children do notice when parents are not getting on very often and they may want to have a voice. But whether or not that is good for them is something that certainly when we came to this first research project, we weren't at all sure about. What did children think about this? I mean, we knew that parents were reluctant. We knew that uh, mediators from our earlier project, the, the mapping, mapping Paths to Family Justice Project, we knew that there were gatekeepers preventing child-inclusive mediation happening. But what we did, and we also knew that child inclusive mediation was the closest we had in England. Well, so anything that approached being Article 12 UN is the RC compliance. So if we wanted to make a case for more child inclusive processes out of, out of court, or indeed in court, but that's a separate matter, we were concerned about the out of court space. What did children think? You know, surely we couldn't sort of go waving banners about this is the way forward without talking to children. So that was how we sort of got this project off the ground. And we, we then really had to take it from, from there. Right? As Jana said, mediator confidence in the process is a determinant of whether or not child inclusive mediation happens. But are there benefits or, or are there dangers for children in including them in this uh, process. And how can we, by talking to children who'd experienced it, that was one thing we wanted to do, but also making sure that what was being offered in child inclusive mediation was, as we imagined, um, as, as the, the close to the Lundley model as you could get, um, as things stood, but what did you need to do to make it uh, even better and actually make it work for children so that their Article 12 rights were not just theoretical and an adult secret, if you like, that nobody bothered to tell children they had, but actually a reality in this very important space. Because you, what, what is more important to a child as they're growing up than knowing what the arrangements for them are uh, in, in terms of seeing their parents and, and making sure that that worked well for their welfare and aligned as far as possible with their wishes. So we, we were really hoping to sort of get children on our side, if you like, to make the, the London model really work and demonstrate the benefits um, of CIM from the children's perspective in order that that would then build a virtuous circle so we got practitioners more confident, children, you know, begging to be asked and, and expressed to, to express a view. And in all of that process, making a very difficult situation for children as, as best as it could be. So we found that, that as Jana said, the Lundy model incredibly useful in analyzing our data. And what was in really immediately obvious to us is that, that actually this model aligns really well with what the children were saying to us. So Becky, one of our focus group participants, said uh, giving young people a platform to be able to speak about what's bothering them about arrangements, surely that's better than just leaving them to, to get on with what's decided. Well, they're obviously talking about a voice and a space. I think in that, as you said, Laura, that, there, there's overlap here. But but straight away, you know, that, that idea of a platform, actually having somewhere that was that was uh, going to enable them to launch their view and express their, their views in, in the way that Article 12 envisages, that was that was what Becky wanted, what immediately became apparent. But you also need that space to be the right space so they do feel able to express their view. And, and Blake, and he, he said, I liked going there because it was nice and calm and you feel that you could just tell the mediator all about it and that they would understand. So straight away, that space is important in that, in that contextual sense of making it somewhere they can open up and offer their, their views. Um, and from, from, from that point, you have to go on and, and make sure that they've got the space, they've got the voice, and then the, the second 
audience and influence, if you like, aspects of the model. Um, in, in a way, will follow. You have to facilitate them, but you have to start somewhere. And I think that the space that allows the voice to happen is all important. And child inclusive mediation, uh, we heard a lot about lovely sofas and plants and a, a very nice environment in which they felt comfortable. And you might think that's, well, you know, just, just uh, a, a really minor point. But for the children, that it, it came through that that sort of ambiance is absolutely critical to them telling the mediator what they needed to know to, to, to needed to know in order for child inclusive mediation to be successful and by that i mean that they can go back to the parents and as far as far as the child child allows because it's negotiated essentially between the mediator and the child what the mediator should tell the parents but we also found that where that was done well, it could reduce conflict between the parents. It opened the parents' eyes. So actually getting that first step right can not only be good for the, the child, as, as I, I will say our data definitely shows, but it can also help reduce conflict and, and make mediation more successful. So, um, so it... it we know that the children were basically on side and that the ambiance of the physical space is very important. So what what do you have to do next? Well, the the, the they they the, the mediator, and I think this is a really important point about child inclusive mediation, you need the skills for the mediator to be able to do this well. Because if you do it badly, then I think you do come back to a point where you think, well, we should be protecting children. We shouldn't be exposing them to yet more dangers in a very traumatic, traumatic and difficult point in their lives. So getting it right and getting the training right is something that you know we really need to do um, incredibly well. But if you do get it right, it, we, from what we have found, the mental health and well-being benefits of a safe and inclusive place is is really enormous. Um, and Felicity actually used that word uh, in, in an enormous per. Uh, well, she was a parent indeed, but she felt for her. Uh, children, it was an enormous purpose of allowing me to feel that the children had got someone else who has got their back and who gives them an impartial space in which to speak. So all of that's important, the impartiality and the, the, having their back, you know, this professionalization, it, a professionalism, I should say, uh, in that space. That's another aspect, if you like, of, of that goes beyond the physical that you have to create within that space. And uh, uh, Luckily, if you like, this aligned with the relationship professionals we use as well, that if you give children a voice or give anybody a voice, it makes you feel valued. And that's the key bit. It may not change things, but I have been heard is how the child comes out feeling. Um, also, um, he, he goes on to say, being heard uh, uh, <clears throat> and finding a safe way to express how we feel about these things allows the words to get out. So you, you have to build beyond the physical, you start with the physical environment, but you beyond, build beyond it to this professionalism that will carry through to achieve what we want to do in, in child inclusive mediation and gain the confidence of the parents and align with the thinking of relationship professionals about what that means for children. So, um, I, Child inclusive mediation can do that, but you have to do it well and in, in the right way. So once you've got the space right, you have to make sure that the voice um, is, is there as well. Um, and, and the benefits of this both stop frustration, if you like, with children of actually feeling they're being silenced. And certainly some of the focus groups we, we conducted were quite, um, they were very vociferous in their, in their views that it's outrageous that children are not asked. So um, mediation is a safe space. Mediation only opens up the doors, like, like having, out, having it just shutting off um, the help. I think it's really stupid that you wouldn't speak to children when it's their lives, their time that's changing, because you don't know what they are actually thinking until they tell you, which is exactly your point, I think. So we, we, we certainly found, without even mentioning the Lundy model, or indeed Article 12, to any of our, our groups as such, 
uh, that 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 the, this definitely aligned with 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 the thinking of, of the groups. And and some of these groups, the children had been involved in me, um, mediation themselves. Others they hadn't. Often they'd been involved in break, uh, relationship breakdown of their parents without doing this. So we had a, a, a wide range of views within these groups. Um, and th this idea of having your back and feeling to get getting having a space in which you can use your voice is is articulated by Chloe showing that overlap again I like seeing the mediator because with things that I was worried about or didn't know about it just made me feel a bit more aware of what was going on but you know we all like to be in control of our lives and and why do we think that children don't um certain children who suspect that things aren't actually going uh, to plan as much as as perhaps they should, and some of the the, the parents also uh, confirmed that their children began to thrive after this. They felt empowered. They felt they can drive their own lives through what's happened. That they're entitled to an opinion. So they that this idea of being valued because they've been given a voice, and. Um, it aligns with Jacob Beardsley, the, the relationship professional, who says what stymies children processing grief on separation is not knowing what's going on. So you can't identify the loss you need to grieve. You can't put into language what is happening. That is not good for children's mental health. You need an outlet. It has to be the, the right outlet in the right way. But to, to just make them bottle it up inside, I think is just asking for trouble. So um, I, I think um, it, it, later life, I mean, they, again, the, the relationship professionals that later on go on to, to say that, that if you don't let children have this opportunity, they carry a sense of blame into adulthood. And then, you know, if they're lucky, they seek therapy and they can resolve it better as they are, are grow, growing up or are grown up. But how much better would it be to actually let them have that moment where they can be be part of this decision and not feel that that they have to bottle it up and carry this sense of blame and to actually understand what's going on and that it knowing very often well it's never their fault it's just a, an unfortunate situation so i think the evidence is clear upholding children's article 12 right to express their views um as the first stage of of, of the lundley model um indicates is uh, really important to sustain uh, young people's mental health and well-being when their parents are separating. That was certainly the conclusion we came to. So then you move on to stage two of the Lundy model, which is the, 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 the audience, if you like, um, the, uh, the, the children's right to have their voices given due weight. And that's the two parts of audience and, and influence. So starting with audience, that's about ensuring that children's views are communicated to somebody with responsibility to listen. Um, so as I say, child inclusive mediation, when it done, is done well, does give this, these young people a forum in which to communicate how they're feeling to a neutral third party. And that is valued. Um, while I'm coached in the mediation technique of reframing, as it's called, the young people did recognize that the mediator would convey their views more palatably to their parents, freeing the children from the, 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 the responsibility of um, having to tell the parents themselves what they actually felt. And as Aaliyah um, said to the mediator, um, as a media, sorry, as Alia said, the media would feed back to parents so that it came across in a nicer way than had the child to do it themselves directly to the parents. So um, it's a good idea to have a third party shares. It, it is that isn't involved in the family to take the perspectives of young people and feed it back to the parents. I feel if the parents take the information from children themselves, it doesn't come across in the nicest way to the other parent. And actually children try to protect their parents from what they really think in the same way the parents in this process are trying to protect um, the children from, from um, the, some of the, the, the worst parts of, of relationship breakdown, if not, not all of it. So actually having that channel of communication um, as constructed in this audience uh, concept is, is really what everybody needs. 
And um, moving on, I mean, Johnny there, um, who had experience child inclusive mediation himself, he, he, he explained what he was doing with mum and dad. I want to make them both happy. So I change my own opinions. But if I wasn't personally telling them, then I could actually say what I meant. And this is part of the problem in child arrangements disputes, is that parents go into the room, if, if, you're not, if it's not child inclusive, and you know, dad will say, well, I know little Johnny thinks this, and the mum will say, well, I know little Johnny thinks that, and we both know what's best with him, for him, and it's exactly the opposite of what the other parent is saying. And that's the problem with disputes on relationship breakdown. So we do think, um, and we are supported by Johnny in this, that actually having the, the true voice of the child, if you like, getting to the parents taken seriously will um, enable all of them perhaps to get on better, reduce conflict, but perhaps resolve things in a way that, that suits everybody better um, longer term. And um, the second quote there is from um, a, a young a person who, well, there, there was domestic violence involved, and and they said, I was scared that if I said something to my dad, he would think it's all my mum's fault, and that I'm saying all that um, because of, you know, I'm, I am saying all that, which is it isn't, because I really do think and say it to another person and know they won't go back to him just made me a lot more happier. Sorry, the English is <laughs> not my English, if, if you like, but those were her, his, her words. That, that knowing that they didn't have to... It, it, children often say something and the other parent says you're only saying that because your mum or your dad told you to say it that's not what you really think so having that neutral um conduit that that explained this really was how they felt and being able to express fear um in in that context as well so it, it means for a young person who felt unsafe to be heard and 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 taken seriously that that they have got their concerns relayed via the mediator. And even if, you know, whatever the outcome, it made them feel a lot happier about the situation and, and to an outcome that, that made them feel um, safer. So um, really important. Um, again, the, the, the mental health benefits of all of this are, are I, I hope, clear. Um, Doug Henderson, a parent, I mean, the, the, a lot of the, the parents were reluctant at first, but came round to thinking this was a really good thing. I think um, his daughter definitely feels a lot more confident. Now she knows that her feelings and ability to express her satisfaction or dissatisfaction will be taken seriously. And for a child of her age, that's a big thing. Um, and that's backed up by Shelley Jackson about the powerfulness of allowing a young person to be heard in a situation um, as such as that. And express how they feel and pass those opinions via someone else to their parents. It's not about giving the full power and control to the child or young person to say whatever you decide is going to be what will happen, but it is about being heard. So uh, I think that that audience is important, the seriousness with which the views are taken, even if it's not leading to that exact outcome, knowing that you've been taken seriously is, is what children want to feel. And again, I think it definitely promotes their well-being and prevents um, the sorts of harm that we know go on when people when people don't take children seriously at all, and they're just told to do what they're told without ever having been asked whether that's appropriate from from their perspective. So, um, when when is it appropriate though? I mean, that that is a difficult. And some of the, the children that we interviewed were not happy <laughs> that their views were not followed, but the vast, vast majority were very um, pleased and understood that the process had been fair, it had been supportive, that their opinion was valued, even if they didn't get what they want. But often it did lead to something that was very positive um, for the children one way or another. Um, Max, who was one of our focus group participants, um, really was was very vociferous in saying that you shouldn't let your parents decide what's going to happen in your life when it's not their life that they are making decisions for. 
And that was a view that, that came through. Obviously, you have to then be, be sure that what they want is not going to be unsafe for them or, or cause other problems. But um, Anna, another young person who had experienced child inclusive mediation, said even if the decision didn't go their way, they would know that somebody had heard them and you know that there was a reason and had gone a certain way. It's actually quite cathartic for children to be able to explain what's going on to someone and for someone to listen to them. We heard the word cathartic a lot, actually, from, from the young people we spoke to. And I think that just, again, underlines the, 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 the importance of knowing that your, your voice is being taken seriously and that you might have an effect or at least know the reason why not. And you know, perhaps that could, when you're older can be an example of, of how things might change later on. And um, Alex, for example, at, at the end there, he was very delighted, I think it's fair to say, that, that he felt that he had been instrumental in helping his parents sort out um, what he was doing. Okay, so I, I think um, that, that we, we, we can say that, that, that we're wish that the, the children's views are, are very positive. You can see on that last slide there that the parents um, and the relationship professionals agree that it's so important to make sure that children have this form and that that is very good for the for the children. And that the evidence that we have is that that this is going to do nothing other than be positive for, for those children's mental health. Um, the, 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 there's where children are part of it and you're trying to change the situation, as the, the Bobby Gordon uh, quote shows, um, children feel invested in what's being decided. And that, that again, means that they, they are not feeling put upon and um, insignificant in, in this difficult situation in their lives as well as in their parents' lives. Um, and we, we really think that the evidence from our project shows that giving children space, voice, audience, and influence, as um, the London model um, indicates, without doubt has mental health and well-being benefits of the children that go far beyond simply, simply helping parents reach agreement. Shouldn't be imposed on children. You know, if they don't want to participate, that's a completely different matter than if they do. But being asked if they want to express a view and facilitating that where they do is really, really um, a, a positive uh, from our findings. And just to finish, um, th there's more about this in the book. We, we think there should, we, we don't think mediation should just be about parental autonomy. That, that, that is the, 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 the underlying philosophy of mediation, but we think we need to, to change that in, in child arrangements context to make sure that they do include the voice of the child in that meaningful way that the and, and the lovely model gives that practical ability to do that thank you i mean thank you very much to, to, to all of our speakers you know uh, telling us today and, and reminding us today of this very very important human right in article 12 of the uncrc um, the need for children to have safe spaces for expressions of their views not confined to the mature child as you say um, you know, to support children to form and express their views, uh, the need for active listening by the right people, ensuring influence that's realistic and transparent, meaningful engagement with children and being patient with them, and then providing fast, full, child-friendly uh, follow-up. These are the messages that come through uh, strongly in that. And then Jan very helpfully uh, took us through the uh, uh, through the study showing that uh, in terms of space not all children or all children over 10 were having access to these spaces uh, the range of options were limited in terms of voice uh, uh, there were you know there's a good rapport with mediators but the audience wasn't uh, always uh, you know conveying uh, uh, children's uh, voices to the uh, to the uh, to the people who, who, who matter um, uh, and, and you know, similarly with influence. And so I think we made, we made some fantastic recommendations for change, incorporating the UNCRC, um, you know, uh, expansion of the meaning of parental responsibility, adopting the Lundy model, uh, and, and having a code of practice. Uh, and um, and then um, you know, as um, 
uh, had, had, um, um, we were reminded um, also by uh, Anne's talk about the, the importance of listening to children on their mental health and the, the usefulness of, of indirect communication you know, to get around those barriers of parents and, and children uh, communicating. Um, so um, I think it's been a, a, a brilliant session. Uh, I, I've, I've certainly learned a lot. Uh, I'd like to thank Jan for, for organizing this uh, excellent event. Uh, and also, I think we should uh, thank Ella Fox for her administrative uh, work helping us, uh, and also Daniel Bates for technical assistance uh, tonight. Thank you to all of our speakers, uh, and of course, to all of you for coming here uh, this evening. Um, for those of you who are with us here now, we have a, a reception in the lower atrium of the building uh, where there are some drinks and some canapes. So we'll draw close to the proceedings now, and uh, we can all go downstairs and, and have a drink. It'd be lovely to chat with you more informally. Thank you very much to our speakers. Can we thank them in the usual way?